Uh, and I thought I was pretty cynical uh, and worldly uh, five years ago. Um, and of course, I was uh, simply a very young and naive fool uh, in retrospect. Um, and learning how to, from being within inside the center of the storm, I have learnt you know, not just about the structure of government, not just about how power flows in many governments around the world that we've dealt with, but rather how history is shaped and distorted by the media. And I think the distortion by the media of history of all the things that we should know so we can collaborate together as, as a civilization, is, is the worst thing. It, it is our single greatest impediment to advancement. But it's changing. We are, we are routing around um, media that is close to power in all sorts of ways. And, but it's not a foregone conclusion, which is what makes this time so interesting that we can rest um, the internet and we can rest the various communications mechanisms we have with each other into the values of the new generation that has been educated by the internet, has been educated outside of that mainstream media distortion. And all those young people are becoming important within institutions. So may, maybe this is something I'll speak about with you later, Amy, but um, I do want to talk about what it means when institutions, how the most powerful institutions uh, from the CIA to News Corporation are all organized, at, all organized using um, computer programmers using system administrators, using technical young people. What does that mean when all those technical young people adopt a certain value system and that they are in an institution where they do not agree with the value system and yet actually their hands are on the machinery? Because there, there has been moments in the past like that. Uh, and though it is those technical young people who are the most internet educated and have the greatest ability to receive the new values that are being spread and the new information and facts about reality that are being spread outside mainstream media distortions. I feel now like that Stalinist commentator, you know, the leader has spoken, I provide the deeper meaning and so on, <laughs> with pleasure. No, first I would really like to begin with what you said, it's extremely important. I have a philosophical term for it. When you moved from right to speak, right to know, communication and so on, I think that, as many of you know, in the history of modern thought, the first one to formulate this was Immanuel Kant in his wonderful distinction between private and public use of reason. This distinction is so wonderful because for Kant, private use of reason is not, I gather with my friends in the kitchen of my apartment or a pub. No, private use of reason is for Kant, theological faculty, legal faculty, political sciences, where what you are thinking, debating, developing, serves a goal set up in advance by a power structure or ideological structure and so on. For Kant, we here, at a distance from this hierarchic uh, political, in the sense of establishment, of course, of establishing power structure space, we are the public use of reason. And why is this so important? Because what I see WikiLeaks as part of a global struggle which doesn't concern only in the narrow sense this domain of right to know in the sense of right to information and so on, but even education, you know you, by you I mean UK citizens here, what horrors are being made 
now in the UK university reform, new privatizations and so on and so on. This is all one concerted attack on the public use of reason. It goes on all around Europe. The name is so-called Bologna High Education Reform, and the goal is very clear. They say it. It's to make universities more responsive to social life, to social problems. It sounds nice. What it really means is that we should all become experts. As a French guy, later minister, explained to me in a debate in Paris, uh, you, uh, for example, cars are burning in Paris suburbs. What we need is psychologists who will tell us how to control the crowd, urbanists who will tell us how to restructure the streets so that the crowd is easy to break up or whatever. Like, we should be here as a kind of a, a ideological or specialist servicemen to resolve problems formulated by others. I think this is the end of intellectual life as we know it. And we should go here to the end, you know, when all those uh, right-wing anti-immigrant bullshitters are talking about, uh, sorry, I used the word, I shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> Do it in a Stalin's way, put some music of some heroic working class <laughs> song there. Sorry, but more seriously, when we uh, hear about uh, oh, immigrants, Pakistanis, Muslims, a threat to Judeo-Christian civilization. No, sorry, the greatest asset of Judeo-Christian civilization, which you can even detect it in notions of Holy Spirit as a community of believers outside established structures, it's precisely this independent space of public reason. So I'm saying that if there is something really to defend, of the so-called, I hate the word also, Judeo-Christian legacy, this idea of democracy, not only as this masturbatory right to cast a vote totally isolated, but as you said, public space of debate, communication, and so on, then that should be our answer to all those uh, 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 populist anti-immigrants and so uh, anti-immigrant politicians and so on. Not this white liberal guilt, oh, you are, uh, you are defending Judeo-Christian legacy, and no, we, we feel guilty, my God, how many bad things we did, all the bad things in the world are the result of European imperialism. Okay, maybe, but what we should say to them is, who are you to even speak about Judeo-Christian legacy? This uh, university reform today in UK, this is the greatest threat of, to Judeo-Christian legacy and so on. Anti-immigrants, they are the nightmare. Imagine Le Pen in power in France and so on. That's the end of Europe for me in the sense of what is uh, progressive in Europe. So again, this is for me part of a much larger struggle which especially with the problems to date, ecological problems, for example, it is so crucial. Let me give you an example, which I think is so beautifully clear. Recently, and that's why I would also like to ask you, if I may, through you, like, uh, you and China, not you, 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 WikiLeaks and China, because Chinese people will pay such a price for precisely the oppression of public space of reason where? My Chinese friends told me this. In uh, China now, a month or two ago, even the government admitted the catastrophic ecological consequences of those three gorges then. You know, it's the greatest artificial lake in the world for 250 miles, 400 kilometers long. Now they, the government, admitted that the problem is this one. That lake is just above some subterranean faults where which they move when there is an earthquake. So they admitted that the big, you remember three years ago or when the big Sichuan or where earthquake was if not triggered, definitely rendered much stronger because of this. And this is not along the lines of what you must have some proverb like, you know, after the battle everyone can be the wise general. No, friends, when I visited Beijing four or five years ago, my friends there told me majority of geologists were already warning the government about these dangers. Second thing, because of this collection of water there, the effect of drought are now much stronger felt. 
point two, because the water is too low, the whole, uh, you know that the Yellow River is the main, uh, the main uh, transportation line venue in China, and the traffic there is practically stopped, and so on and so on. All this is uh, the end of public reason. So now, uh, just, to, uh, just to conclude, just one more thing. Nonetheless, this is not a critical point towards you, but a point to clarify what WikiLeaks can do. We should not fetishize truth as such. We live in times of incredible ideological investments, of times when ideology is very strong precisely because it's not even experienced as ideology and what can happen. Let me tell you a story from Israel, my friends told me there. Some five, six years ago, one of their historians uh, wrote a more truthful account, you know, of how also in the independence 48-49 war the Israeli army did burn some Palestinian villages and so on and so on. A more balanced view. And first all the leftist critics uh, had a kind of intellectual orgasm, oh wonderful and so on. And then they got a shock of lifetime when this guy said no, 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 but I meant that was necessary to do. We should have done it even more. The line of this guy was, we should have thrown all the Palestinians from the West Bank and we wouldn't have any problems today. So, you know what I'm trying to say? That I disagree not with you, but for example, with another person for whom I have respect, Noam Chomsky. A friend of mine told me that Chomsky told him recently at a lunch they had together in New York that today all the obscenities are so clear that we don't need any critique of ideology, we just need to tell to people the truth. No. Truth must be contextualized in the sense of what does it justify, what does it say, what does it deny, and so on, and so on. So, to really conclude, this would have been uh, my, my point about WikiLeaks, that you are not just simply telling the truth. You are telling the truth in a very precise way of confronting explicit line of justification, rationalization, or whatever, the public discourse with its implicit presuppositions. It's not just about telling the truth. And this is very important. Why? Now I conclude, don't be afraid. Because you know this wonderful Marx Brothers joke, which I think serves perfectly as a model of today's ideology. Why? Because, like, if you listen to, if you have listened to someone like, you know, that failed businessman who then ruined the American army as a defense minister, Donald Rumsfeld called, no? No, I read the biography of him, they prove it conclusively that, my God, he was even a very stupid bad manager when he was a, it's a total myth that he was a business genius, but okay, to the point, when, uh, how, uh, uh, basically his cynical line about Iraq, when it was discovered that there were no weapons of mass destruction and so on, was that, uh, okay, we were lying, but we were lying in a truthful way with a good intention, we manipulated you, but this was part of a larger strategy and so on. This is maybe the most, okay, intelligent, tricky and effective cynical defense of a liar. When he said, okay, I'm lying, but so what? I openly confess that I was lying, so in a way, I'm truthful. Here, we should repeat that Marx Brothers saying, and this is what you de facto are doing, I claim. You know that wonderful phrase from Groucho Marx, I think, when he is playing a lawyer, defending his client, and he says, this guy looks as an idiot and acts as an idiot. This shouldn't deceive you, this guy is an idiot. We should say to Donald Rumsfeld, okay, you admit you act as a liar, you are a cheater and a liar. But this will not deceive us. You effectively are a cheater and a liar. We should not allow them this space of selling their lies themselves in a cynical way as a deeper truth. This is how ideology today functions.